Close your eyes. Really, close your eyes. I'd like you to take a minute and think about math. What thoughts come to mind? Does it bring up any old memories? How does it make you feel? Okay, open your eyes. Some of you might have been sitting there thinking about how much you love math. But I bet that more of you felt a little anxiety. Or maybe you thought about a hard math class that you had when you were a kid. Or maybe you were sitting there thinking, please don't make me do math today. <laughs> you can relax. I'm not. The good news is you're not alone. There are a lot of people who feel the exact same way about math. And I get it. When we were kids, for most of us, the teacher stood in front of the class, explained some procedure we needed to memorize, and then made us sit quietly at our seats and do more practice problems. And don't even get me started on the homework, which I'm pretty sure was at least 100 problems a night, not to mention the dreaded word problem that we really hoped we didn't have to do. And all of that for what? I mean, sure we should be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But we all carry calculators with us everywhere we go now, so how good at it do we even really have to be, right? Plus, how much of this math stuff do we need once we get out of school? Well, instruction has progressed, but not without a lot of pushback. Because everyone has experience with math in some capacity, maybe as a student, or as a parent, or even as a teacher, there have always been lots of opinions, strong opinions, about how math should be taught. And then along came the Common Core, which set out to change the way that we think about and approach math. And you want to talk about people being mad? Whew. I've heard lots of arguments against the Common Core. One of the arguments that I hear the most often is that it's not the way that we learn math. But those same people would likely say that their math classes were boring and pointless, and they might even say they're not good at math. So why should that be the goal for the way that we teach kids math now? Shouldn't we want them to be taught better? Of course we should. But as we all know, change is hard and it's scary. And the truth is, even though we maybe didn't like learning about them, we are comfortable with the steps and the procedures, the algorithms that we all know. But here's the thing about an algorithm. It is both the floor and the ceiling of math. What I mean is that when you're solving problems, to be able to solve a problem using an algorithm, you have to know and be able to complete all of the steps that it requires. But then that's it. There's nothing else. It doesn't allow for any flexibility in thinking. It doesn't allow for creativity of problem solving. It doesn't even require that you understand the steps that you're doing. And the reason is that algorithms are shortcuts that were created for people who already know math. Algorithms are not for kids who are just learning how to do math. So I'd like to share a story. Um, a few months ago, my second and third grade class went on a field trip to visit some entrepreneurs in order to prepare for opening their own pop-up shops for our school's marketplace. And at one of the businesses, the owner separated them into small groups and had them do some inventory. And this group right here counted 12 of their product, and then they were asked how much would the business owner bring in if each of them cost $8.50. You got it yet? Oh, wait. <laughs> That's right. I told you I wasn't going to make you do math. OK. Uh, well, let me tell you what they did. So you can see they started here trying on pencil and paper. And then I came up and I said, OK, guys, how much is $12, $8? And one of my third graders quickly solved it in his head, and he told me 96. And I said, how much is 12 50 cents? Not really sure how that was going to go. And my second grader, she said, well, 12 50 cents is the same as six $1. So that's $6. And then they added the 96 and the six. 
Now that may not seem like that big of a deal, but just think about that for a second. We got off of that piece of paper, they solved it mentally in their heads, and my second grader did a two-digit by two-digit multiplication problem that involved a decimal. I can assure you those are not things I teach in second grade. But they're able to do this because they're thinking about and making sense of the numbers, which helps them to use them flexibly. Those are the kinds of things that make me excited as a teacher. Thinking like that, though, requires instruction that helps them to see that numbers are more than just symbols on a page. They need instruction that helps them to understand that numbers are real quantities. And the operations that we use, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, those are actions that help us to solve real life problems. So I have an example. Now, this might look confusing, but this is actual real kid work from my class. Um, and they all get this problem. They all got this problem. I gave this to my third graders, and we went over the problem to make sure that they all understood it, understood it, and then I sent them off to go work on it, and they could solve it however they wanted. They could use manipulatives. They could draw pictures. They could think about the numbers in any kind of way that they wanted to that would help them to solve the problem. Then we all come back together. A few kids share their strategies, and then we discuss. And that's where the magic really happens. Because in the discussion, we get to look at the variety of strategies that the kids used. We get to think about why things work. We get to compare and contrast. And all these things help us dig into the bigger, the deeper ideas of math and start to generalize about strategies and rules. So in this problem, my kids were working on being able to connect, make the connection between division and fractions. We were still working on making sure we understood what a fraction actually is. We talked about equivalent fractions. We talked about adding fractions. And one of my kids was able to see that repeated addition of fractions, and she made the connection to what she understands about multiplication and came up with a, fraction, a number of sentence that involved multiplication of a fraction. Also, not something I teach in third grade. I couldn't have stood up and tried to teach all of these things in one lesson if I wanted to. But because they experienced it, and these are their ideas, it all made sense to them. Now, if that's not enough, there's even more. When I thought about talking to a group of people, it occurred to me that everybody might not be as excited about math as I am. <laughs> so I had to think about why is this relevant to everyone? And sure, you know, I'm sure most of you have heard about a push for math or maybe that buzzword STEM. We actually just heard it. Um, <laughs> or that maybe we won't have enough people to fill math jobs in the future. But all of those things still may not make this feel relevant. So let me tell you why this conversation is important for everyone. Math is not just about numbers. Math is about thinking. At the beginning of the year, I started giving my kids problems just like these. And I presented the problem in the same way. We made sure everybody understood it. I sent them off with the tools that they might need and told them to try to solve it. The result? Frustration and tears. <laughs> yep, that's right. I made kids cry. <laughs> uh, I'm not proud of it, but I do think that it was necessary. I think a lot of times we have a tendency to want to make things not as hard for kids. But the truth is, we learn the most when things are hard. So they wanted me to just tell them how to do it. They did. He should just tell us. But I wouldn't, because every time I just tell them what to do, I am taking away an opportunity for them to do the thinking. And so now at this point in the year, my kids know that I will pretty much always answer a question with a question. But there's less frustration, there are fewer tears, and there are a whole lot more thinking. 
So what happens is that now when they're stuck, they learn that they have to find a place to start by thinking about what they already know. When it's hard, they learn that sometimes we have to struggle and fight to persevere through frustration. When they try, they learn they're going to make mistakes, but that they can use those mistakes to try to figure out what their next steps could be. When they attempt to solve it based on what they know, they're learning to think flexibly. When they solve it, they learn that hard work after success after hard work feels really good. When they listen to each other, they learn to respect dis differences because they can see that there's more than one way to solve a problem, and not everyone is going to solve it like they do. So don't you see? These are not just math skills. These are the skills that you want your coworkers to have. These are the skills that you want your friends to have, or your neighbors, or anybody that you interact with, because these are life skills. So when I think back to this problem, this was really hard for some of my kids. They struggled. They sat. They weren't sure what to do. But look at what they were able to accomplish. The goal of math education has to be to improve math understanding. That is a given. But I also think that it's time for us to recognize that math can and should have a much bigger purpose. Before I came out on stage, you guys looked at this problem. So now you tell me what is really needed to solve it. Thank you. <laughs>